Welcome and hello. My name is Dawn Bittison. I'm a museum specialist at the Alaska Office of the Arctic Studies Center, part of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Voices from Cedar, Southeast Alaska Wind Instruments. Before we begin our conversation with John Hudson, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional and present day lands of the Denina Athabascan people. I live and work in a place called Darayakak in the upper inlet dialect of the Denaina Kanaga language. The name that colonizers gave this place is Anchorage. I thank the Denina Athabascan people for the place where my home is and for the place where I work. I would also like to thank our partners and funders whose support made this event and the video resources we'll be sharing possible. The Siri Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution's Recovering Voices Program, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and the generous supporters of the Arctic Studies Center here in Alaska. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker, John Hudson. You can find out more about him on the event website. John grew up in Seattle watching his father, Simshin master artist Jack Hudson, carve totem poles, masks, and other artwork. At the age of 19, John moved to Metlakatla, Alaska to apprentice with his father and begin his art career. His father was the traditional arts teacher for the Annette Island School District for 37 years and John took over this community role after Jack retired 11 years ago. In addition to teaching full time, John continues to work as an artist and knife maker and he's a member of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's Native Arts Committee. John has won numerous awards including the 2019 Alaska Governor's Award which he co-received with his father. John is also the featured teacher in a new set of online instructional videos titled Voices from Cedar. Let's take a quick look at the videos. Um, our tech assistant, Katie, will share her screen now. The link takes you to our main learning lab page, Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center in Alaska. And here in the first section, you can find general information about Alaska Native cultures, including essays written by Alaska Native scholars, photographs, discussions with elders and knowledge keepers about heritage objects in the Smithsonian collections. And in the second section, you can find educational materials featuring Alaska Native heritage for teaching at home or in a classroom. And here in the third section, are educational videos about Alaska Native arts featuring Alaska Native instructors. And in the first set of videos here, Voices from Cedar, John provides cultural information about Southeast Alaska wind instruments and teaches how to carve a whistle from start to finish, including tools, materials, techniques, testing and refining. There's also information about John and a downloadable PDF with diagrams of the whistle interiors and photos, and those will help students with their designs. We'll also be adding additional photos from John's research at the Smithsonian collections. Okay, let's go live with John. Hi, John. Hello. Thank you for joining us from Metlakatla. Would you, uh, I, I'd like to start by asking you uh, to share some of what you've learned from your research on wind instruments uh, made and used in Southeast Alaska. First of all, thank you uh, for, for having me and thank you to everybody who's making this possible. And uh, once again, thank you to everybody who's uh, joining us today. Um, I'm in my shop in Metlakatla, Alaska here, and I'm, I'm excited to share what I've, uh, what I've been able to, to learn. Um, I applied for a, a fellowship to go out to the, the CRC in Suitland, Maryland uh, with the Smithsonian. And my focus of interest was um, Northern Northwest Coast wind and reed instruments and um, even some clappers and things like that. And the reason I was so interested in this was because I knew about whistles and wind instruments and I'd seen some examples of a few, um, but I didn't really know how prevalent they actually were on the, on the Northwest coast. And so um, I think, I think the, the people giving the fellowship thought that was interesting because it is kind of a part of our, of our culture that um, is not as prevalent as it used to be. And one of the things I really uh, found fascinating is as I was um, looking through the, the drawers and cabinets of wind instruments, um, just how many examples 
there, there still are that exist and the different sizes and the different shapes um, and, and the different usages and how creative they were. Some of them were just simple forms, but beautifully done. Some were very artistically uh, crafted. They had sculpture. Um, I saw some wind instruments that, that were almost four feet tall. Um, you know, and I, I don't quite understand the workings of all those yet. I'm um, still, still looking into that, but I saw everything from little tiny uh, whistles that were made out of bones um, and everything in between, single note uh, whistles and multiple stop pipe whistles and with uh, instruments that had beating reeds uh, built into the inside. Um, so what fascinated me was, wow, there's so many of these. They must have been in prevalent use. Um, we're not using them as much as we used to. And so I was, uh, I was really fascinated by the creativity and to learn more about um, how these were used and to learn how to make them. Can you show us some wind, in wind instruments that you have in your studio? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, um, in conjunction with the Voices of Cedar, I'm also doing um, an online class with 10 students. And um, we are, we're making whistles. And in fact, right here is where I've been uh, demonstrating from. I was really lucky to come up with this old whistle. And this whistle I'm sure is at least a hundred years old. I'm guessing it's a little bit more. Um, I don't know what kind of wood this is. I actually think this one might be spruce. Um, and it's wrapped in some uh, like rawhide or sinew um, type of material. And I'm trying to be very careful with it because I know it's fragile. So this is a, um, a whistle that I happen to have in my own collection. And so I thought, you know, as beautifully done as this is, that this is the whistle that we would be trying to emulate in class. So um, we took our blocks of cedar and this is the one I'm currently working on and I'm just getting it shaped and starting to cut the air hole into it. And this is going to um, eventually resemble this really nice uh, example of an older whistle, which is just a beautiful piece it's very utilitarian, but everything was done so beautifully and well-crafted. It just uh, puts me in awe when I look at that. Some other whistles that I have, um, I have this one here. This is one that I made when I was coming out, uh, when I was going to Anchorage for my residency there. And this one here, um, I informally call it uh, Calling All Spirits. And you can see I have a spirit face here and there's a little spirit face looking like that it's coming out of the mouth of the whistle and that represents um, another spirit. And I'm not quite through with this, but this is a whistle um, I have that I've also, um, it's very dear to me because uh, I've used it for my own rituals um, in my personal life. And actually I'll share with everybody that um, at my dad's celebration of life ceremony, I use this uh, whistle um, as the sound that kind of signified my dad passing. And these whistles a lot of times were used for um, a supernatural, a sound of a supernatural event or to draw attention to something. And so I've used this uh, for numerous uh, personal um, things in my life. And this is one that I've made. And I saw a lot of examples of, of whistles that were human type faces where the sound was coming out of the mouth. So this is one, but like I said, these whistles come in so many different sizes and shapes and uh, I'll start showing you some things that I have. Now, this is a whistle that I think is in some of the videos. Um, it's not finished yet. And I thought to myself, uh, one of the reasons I'm gonna use a whistle is I wasn't catching as many fish as I thought I should be. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna bring this whistle out there with me uh, next time I'm fishing and I'm gonna give it a blow and see if it, if it brings some fish to me. And so this is the same principle. It's got the air hole here in a chamber and 
it's a little bit hollowed out inside so it can make the noises. This is another very simple whistle. It's just uh, basically square rounded off and carved down to a mouthpiece. And it's very different looking than the other whistles. This is a whistle that one of my students, uh, my high school students made. Um, she really thought it was cool to have the sound coming out of a mouth. And so she's got her own story behind this, um, but she didn't, she didn't quite have the sculpture skills yet. So she created this whistle and painted the face and her sound is coming out of the mouth. And this one has a, a much higher tone. So that's pretty fun. And when I was out there, I noticed that there was, the whistles had additional holes in them. Uh, and some of the whistles could have two tones out of one whistle. So this is an example of that. Um, so I think there's lots and lots of experimenting still to do with different sounds and tones. But the principle of this is the same as all the whistles so far. Um, this is another whistle I have in my collection. And this one, um, when Davy Boxley Jr., uh, he took a whistle class um, with me. And this is a whistle that he made afterwards. And um, it went up for auction at a school fundraiser here in Metlakatla. And I purchased this. And it's really a nice example of um, of his artwork and he wrapped it in spruce roots. And uh, you've got a simple whistle, but then you've got this really nice sculpture on the end. And then here's another whistle. And I saw lots of examples of whistles and, and I'll refer to a document here in a second that I came across when I was out there. But this whistle has three different air chambers going to three different, um, what they're calling stopped pipes. Um, and so this one, if you see, I've drawn in, there's little faces, looks like mouths uh, for each of the holes. This whistle takes a lot of air um, to use. And I, I always uh, kid around that if, if these multiple pipe whistles were made before uh, first European contact, then we can take credit for, I think, inventing the train whistle, because this one sounds very much like uh, a train whistle. So each of these pipes has a different sound to it. And when they all come together like that, it makes a, a very interesting sound, but it takes a lot of lung capacity um, as well. And yeah, so that's, that's uh, some of the whistles that I have in my collection, but as you can see, the size and the shape and um, artistry, you know, is all over the place and uh, it's really, really fascinating. It's also a fun way to put your artistic uh, talents into, into something. The next question I had actually follows along with a question we have from the audience. So um, I wanted to ask you about your work on making whistles and experimenting with the designs. And we have an audience question saying, John, how did you learn about the tones in relationship to maybe the size of the whistle, the amount to hollow out or other things that affect the tone? Okay, that's a great question. How did I learn about that? Um, well, I'm, first of all, I'm still learning. And uh, secondly, um, when I carved my first whistle, I just was ecstatic when I got it to even make some sound. Um, so, you know, you have to get the little, you have to get the little um, reed just right. You carve it down to this little thin piece here where the, uh, where the air comes in and part of the air comes up out of that hole and part of the air goes in and circulates around those chambers. As far as the tone quality goes, as I was putting it back together and testing it, um, when I first blew into it, 
and it first made a little bit of sound. I was super excited, but it was kind of a stifled a little bit and it felt like it just wasn't getting the air movement. And so I started hollowing out more. And some of the examples I saw out at the Smithsonian had really large um, air chambers inside. And this is just place for the air to go. But really it's a lot of experimenting. It's a lot of experimenting with the size of the air hole here. Uh, every little thing you do changes the tone just a little tiny bit. I don't think I've made two whistles that have the exact same tone. Um, I, I haven't really tried to do that. And the more you hollow out inside of here, the more lung capacity it takes, but it seems to also make a deeper tone. So I think the, the larger the hole and the, the larger the air chambers inside um, deepens the tone. And then also the size of the air chamber where the hole, uh, where the air comes in, that affects the sound also. So really it's just a matter of, as soon as you start getting a little bit of sound out of your whistle, experimenting with taking out a little more inside, making the hole a little bigger, um, or uh, taking out a little more air or a little more wood in the air chamber. And so this one, it's not a real big whistle, but it has kind of a deep tone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is experimenting and, and trying it. So before I move on to the next question, which once again relates to two questions we actually got to, from the audience. So I'm glad we're all on the same sort of um, path here. When, when you went to the Smithsonian collections for the first time before you knew as much as you know now about the construction of whistles, what were you, finding there? What were you looking to find there literally when you had those old whistles in front of you that that were going to lead you to these breakthroughs in design? What was I looking for? Well, the first thing, you know, I'm not even sure if I knew what I was looking for. But when I got there, I started finding things, um, you know, because ahead of time, I, I'm not sure I, I was I knew what to look for. But um, I was number one looking for how did the sound work and um, and like I said the the holes are are really different. Um, this old one here has a very square reed down at the bottom, whereas this one here uh, has a little half round and I saw both of those um, and I guess I was looking to see you know how big they were and and was there a standard size um, and what I found out that there, there wasn't a standard size and that there wasn't a, um, a standard amount to hollow the whistles out. I got to look inside of a few and I got to shine flashlights in some and x-ray some. Um, but I was really looking to see how prevalent they also used to be. And I found out that they were very prevalent. And so uh, it was really exciting um, to get there and just kind of let the collections take me where they needed me to go um, without kind of going in with a preconceived notion. So the next question I wanted to ask and the audience has wanted to ask is about the wood that you use to make a whistle. If you could tell us a bit about that and then specifically the questions we had from the audience. And um, I'm happy to say we have Tim Flannery here with us who was a student in the 2015 workshop. And um, he wanted to know, um, whether or not one type of wood makes a better sound than the other. And then another question is about the resonant quality of cedar wood specifically. Well, so the wood that we happen to be using in the current workshop um, is cedar. These are the cedar blocks. And I tried to pick out some really nice straight grain um, wood so that it would be uh, easier to carve. Um, is one, does one wood sound better than the other? You know, I don't know if they, one wood sounds better than the other. I think that the red cedar, it has a, a little bit of a softer, warmer tone to it. Um, this, this old whistle here, I really suspect this is made out of spruce, um, which people make guitars and stuff out of nowadays. So I think wood in general, 
uh, resonates sound really well. Um, this is one that my dad uh, made, I, I wanna say, um, you know, 20 years ago when he was messing around uh, with whistles. This one's out of yellow cedar and he was just, there, there's nothing fancy about this. He was just trying to um, see how the air chambers worked and things like that. This one has a little bit different tone quality. Little, little sharper of a sound. Um, but I honestly think that since the whistles I saw were not, they were not just made out of bone, I mean wood, but they were also made out of bone and other materials. I think the trick to getting the sound is, is bringing a little piece of whatever material down to something very thin that splits the air. Um, I do find that red cedar produces a warm, maybe the warmest tone. And I think the type of wood you use will affect the tone a little bit. I'm not sure any one is better than the other. I think it's the craftsmanship of the whistle um, and the materials that you have. Yeah, good question. Before I get to my next question, I wanted to ask another audience question. Um, and it is, have you explored the archaeo acoustics of these whistles within clan houses or places where traditionally these examples may have been originally played? Is there a relationship between their construction and how they might have sounded in the places where they would have been used? That's a fantastic question. Um, well, I haven't messed around with that too much, but I can tell you right now, I assume that the size and the material of the whistle and how it was constructed probably uh, on the old Northwest coast, I'm, I'm guessing that the artisans were having that in mind. Um, I know that in our longhouse here in Metlakatla, um, probably the lower, deeper tone whistles would really resonate more, but I'll tell you what, that's something that, because that got asked, um, I think I'm gonna have to run down to the longhouse after this and uh, take the different whistles in there and see, because that's a, that's a fantastic point. I can tell you that um, one of the really fascinating things I found out in the museum collections in, in Suitland, Maryland, there were some whistles that had little bladders attached to the end. And um, I read some accounts where these particular whistles were meant to be kept hidden and the bladder was put underneath the dancer's arm and the whistle was fashioned somewhere out of sight. And if the dancer moved their arm like this, it would cause the whistle to make little woo woo kind of hooting noises type of thing. Um, so there's still a lot of mystery around how these things were used, but um, yeah, that's, um, yep. So we can all see behind you that you have dozens and dozens of carving tools, but I was wondering if you could just show us um, some of the basic tools, you know, like if you were on a desert island, what tools would you need to carve a whistle? If you could show some of those, that'd be great. Sure. So I put together a set of four for the class I'm uh, teaching and we'll talk about those. So I claimed that you could, you might even be able to get by with less, but what I did is I, um, I made a straight knife and this knife here, it doesn't have to be exactly this shape, it's just a straight knife. That allows me to, to cut straight down in and make some good straight cuts. And when we're gonna be making the air chambers, um, you, need a, you need a good straight knife. So this one's pretty small, the blade's small. I, I did that on purpose for, uh, for this class. Um, some straight knives are longer and then some are even longer yet. So um, a, a good straight knife is a, is a must. Um, this particular knife has just the slightest um, bend to it. So it's pretty much straight with just a little upward uh, sweep. And that is really good for rounding things off. Um, and this is what I've been using to carve down into the little air hole. And 
this is a real necessity. You could, you could round off with the straight edge and you can do a little bit of hollowing with this little tiny um, bend at the end. And you notice these knives kind of curve up a little bit like this, and that just kind of keeps your, keeps your hand away from the, the material. Um, now this knife here, this is one I made a long time ago, kind of looks like a fish, um, but it has a long uh, blade that's really pretty straight with just the slightest of bend to it. And that's fantastic for also rounding off the edges. Um, and if you need to do some surfacing on a flat surface, this is curved just enough that you could still get on the top and you could take uh, little bits um, off and leave a very beautiful knife finish. And then the last knife is this one here that once again, it's got a very usable flat um, edge, but the end curves up into a more pronounced hook. And this one is what you're gonna use when you get in there and do your hollowing. Um, you also might use it when you're carving down into this um, spot here to make an air chamber. This will remove a lot of wood for you. It'll get your hollowing uh, tasks done. And so um, it's kind of a necessity also because you have to do some hollowing. So really um, with these four knives here, um, a person could get a lot done uh, with these. And just since we're here talking about tools, this is a tool that I think one of my dad's students made in class with him and they wanted to throw their artistic abilities into the handle and they put a little raven on this handle and the knife curves up in your hand and actually the raven's head there sits with your thumb and helps you helps you carve. So yeah, lots of fun things with tools too, but that's, that's the basic uh, that you need, I think. Okay, and we have one more question from the audience. Would the creation of these whistles predate contact with non-Indigenous peoples? Yes, I think so. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is because there was some really old bone whistles and you know, um, and I think, I think uh, one of the carbon dates on one of these was like getting close to 300 years. And so, um, and you know, I don't really know what these little bone whistles were used for. Who knows, they could, they could have been something as simple as two hunters in the woods, um, you know, blowing on one with a little high pitched uh, to let the other guy know where they're at. Um, so I think the technology and uh, yes, I, they're definitely pre-contact. Now, there are some whistles that were gathered and I wanna talk about um, I came across this uh, paper that was written by Reverend F. W. Galpin, and he was so enamored with uh, the wind instruments and things that he came across uh, on the Northwest coast that he did a whole um, paper on it. And he couldn't believe the level of craftsmanship. And according to him, most of the whistles were pre-contact, but I think after contact, um, some of the whistles uh, shape started to change and some of the, some of the whistles uh, and instruments in that particular um, document almost look clarinet like. So I think certainly they were being made pre-contact and I think uh, after European contact, um, you know, ideas went uh, to what they saw and the whistle started evolving uh, more. So yeah, but I, they were, I saw some examples for sure that were pre-contact. I just wanted to um, ask you, John, um, is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah, because I had the chance to go out and look at whistles and I've made a few and I'm teaching some classes, I absolutely don't think I am the ultimate knowledge and authority on this. I'm still learning. And the one thing I really like is people sharing information. So if somebody makes a whistle or an instrument and they discover something that they like to share with me, I always love hearing uh, something like that. And I even learn from my high school students sometimes. We've made whistles in class 
and the student will come up with an idea and implement it and all will be like, wow, I did not know that. And so um, the, the learning lab and what you put together there and how to make these things, I think it's just kind of the start of people starting to experiment and discover things. Um, and hopefully we can all just keep sharing that information with each other. Thank you, John. We do have one last question from the audience and we'll wrap up after this. Um, I work at an after-school program. Do you have any ideas or designs that would be easy for teens to make? Um, you know, once you understand the principles of, um, of a whistle, you understand that there's an air hole and uh, an air chamber getting to that. Um, depending on the level of your students, if you, you know, these, I, I know um, other artists who have experimented with making whistles out of clay um, and, and pottery type of whistles. So depending on the level, but if you don't want them using carving knives, cause they are, they can be dangerous in the, you know, until they're properly um, trained how to use them. If they are properly trained, yeah, there's some really simple uh, designs um, and I could, I could help you with that. But if you look on the diagram that I, that is gonna be added into the learning lab, um, it basically shows that if you have an air hole that lines up with an air chamber where the air can go out one way or the other, um, any shape or design that makes it simple for you and simple for the students that you're teaching um, will work. But I can certainly touch bases with you if you wanna reach me by email. John, I'd like to uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and insight with us. And uh, both John and I hope that uh, you and the audience and, and perhaps other people you share this information with will find the voices from Cedar videos helpful. Thank you all for joining us for this online event and take care.